We keep talking about it though, at least it's, it's, it's not the it's, it's not the white elephant in the room. We talk about it all the time. Right. When we type right. and when we do yeah. or she know and all it's gonna be I know it is hard. I think you know as long as they're so enjoying it and I know. Um, and alert. And alert. Yeah. And takes her out every day in the car. She loves that. Yeah. I just have to say it because it's, I take her out to the gym every day. Because she wants to do it, right? I mean, yeah. we tried. We got this almost like in bed. The idea was I would sleep downstairs with her. Oh, yeah. She didn't want to be downstairs. No. She wanted to be on the bed. Of But yeah, hanging in there, so to say. Yeah. Oh, but as you know, it's heartbreaking. So I think I'm going to ask you about the Yeah. They seem to be talking. Afterwards, this like so she is lots of pals in the and we have one walker in particular that comes so she gets all the time and then I'll just walk in the afternoon usually at night yeah yeah but yeah she sometimes comes back yeah fresh apples take to dive and get sleep we go to not just walk in but she's always there there's a bit where she can she dies my my one doesn't get hurt. They the other day. They heard something outside. They're both the dogs running to the door at the same time, crashed into each other. He fell down the stairs because they wouldn't let one of them go first. I don't think I think guys are not done. Even though they have been meeting on Thursday. So everything is passed from one to two. Yeah. It becomes so much part of the family. Yeah. I just can't imagine. Oh, is that right? Yeah, I don't know what it is. Um, 
when we say transform, we truly make, mean that difference between actually life and death. And you think that's a lofty goal to have, but many of us in a former life did exactly that. We were able to bring forward medicines that totally changed the lives of patients. And we set up Rally Bio in 2018, the beginning of 2018, to do exactly that. And as I go through the programs that we have, you will see exactly what I mean by that. At the very heart of this mission is the people that we brought together. Um, I have a little bias, but I think they have an unparalleled track record of success, taking medicines all the way from discovery through development into the marketplace. And this group of people have come together uh, over the last uh, few years, and they're truly terrific. I'll mention some of them. It's a little invidious, but I will. And none of them that are in the room is also good. Uh, we're in a strong financial position. Uh, our last uh, report, 150 million uh, in the bank, which uh, that would see us through to the beginning of 2025, just as is just now. We're also very fiscally responsible. We really take uh, the financial side of things deadly serious, and we're very careful with the way that we spend the money. Most of the money goes into programs, uh, as you will see. And then, uh, last but not least, we really want to build a sustainable company at Rally Bio. We're not looking here to bring in a couple of assets and then flip them. We want to build the next, maybe your favorite biotech, engine. That's what we'd like to do here in New Haven, Connecticut. And to do this, Amanda Hayward, who's in the audience, who runs business development, is continuously scouting for new assets to bring into the company. And I think the really interesting thing about that is we look globally. As we talk about some of the programs, you'll see where we have done deals far outside of uh, the United States, actually. In fact, I think we're still waiting on our first US deal, but that, that will come. It's a really important part of the company to bring in assets that are going to fulfill that mission and build a sustainable company. Uh, here's some of the people, and I'll just mention uh, two or three to give you a flavor. Uh, for the talent that we have at Rally Bio. Rasheen Armstrong, she leads our fetal and neonatal alloimmune thrombocytopenia program. Her previous job to doing that, um, Rasheen was the global development team leader for eculizumab in refractory myasthenia gravis and eculizumab in neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder. She took both programs from very small 14 patient proof of concept studies all the way to the marketplace. A truly terrific uh, drug developer. Rachel Alford, who you see up here. Um, Steve Uden, who is my, oh, please come in. Please, oh, photographs as well, gosh. Um, Steve Uden, my fellow co-founder at Rally Bio. As we started the company, we thought it really important to get the CMC side of things to correct early. In our lives in big pharma and biotech, we have seen many companies that have struggled in this domain. And in fact, one person in a biotech company said to me once, how hard can it be to make something? Well, the truth is it's really hard for everybody, whether you're a big company or a small company. So bringing Rachel in very early to run that uh, has proven to be great. Uh, Doug Sheridan on the list, a uh, terrific antibody engineer. Doug was the brains behind and the co-inventor of Ravalismab also known as Ultramirus, which is on the market for the treatment of paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome. Really terrific antibody engineer who works on this whole program. I'll stop there, um, but you get the flavor for the talent that we have uh, inside the company. And many of them are here and will be answering your questions a little later. So let's get on to the portfolio. Number of programs, two in the clinic, where we're looking for uh, proof of concept results uh, by the end of this year, and a number of programs uh, earlier stage in preclinical development, along with this notion of building a sustainable company with a healthy pipeline coming through at all stages. Uh, I mentioned where we did deals. I'll just quickly say the uh, program for fetal and neonatal alumin thrombocytopenia, I'll call that FNAIT from now on, and Ranibar 212, a monoclonal antibody for the prevention 
of that condition. Uh, that was a deal that we did with a Norwegian company. They did the seminal science around the biology in Norway. We did that deal. Um, the complement inhibitors, we got a suite of complement inhibitors from a company called Sobe, which most of you will know the Swedish uh, company. In that case, it was really interesting. We knew these molecules really well from our complement background. And when Sobe as a company decided to move out of research and early development to really concentrate on their commercial platform, they came to us to say we have the suite of assets. They knew us, we knew them. Um, with uh, Rally Bio 311, so the deal that Amanda and her team did uh, with Sanofi, tiny French company, uh, was previously uh, a molecule with Chimab, the uh, British antibody company. Sanofi bought Chimab. Amanda persisted with that company to tell them we were interested in uh, what we call 311 uh, for severe anemia. And then two other, pro uh, two other what I call joint ventures. One is with an uh, Oxford-based, uh, Oxford England-based machine learning AI company. Um, their speciality is small molecule drug discovery, both in terms of the speed of moving through that part of the process and the quality. Uh, so we were uh, able to set this up. The notion is there are many small molecule targets in rare disease. We didn't want to build that capacity, but rather work with this company. And then the most recent deal we did, very similar, and yet uh, it's in the antibody domain. So with Abseller, uh, the Vancouver-based company, again, they have a terrific antibody platform. So the notion is we conceive the targets in rare disease, they produce the terrific molecule. And then we work together as we see these through development. So two really uh, excellent earlier stage collaborations. Let me go on to FNAIT. Um, this is a really program that we're so excited about. There's no treatment, there's no approved treatment for FNAIT today, and yet babies are born every day with the condition somewhere in the world. Now, some of you in the audience will be uh, familiar with a disease called rhesus disease of the newborn. This is where there's an immunological mismatch between the mother and the fetus. And the immunological mismatch occurs because of rhesus antigens on the red blood cell. This was solved decades ago now. Very tiny, tiny numbers of babies are born now uh, with rhesus disease of the newborn because of these molecules that came through Rogan in Winroom. Think of this disease as the platelet equivalent. And so there is an immunological mismatch of an antigen that's on human platelets, affectionately called human platelet antigen uh, A1. And what happens is, and we know the figures on this for the Caucasian population, I'll tell you about it. If the mother is HPA1A negative and the fetus is HPA1A positive, there's an immunological mismatch. And what can happen during pregnancy frequent Frequently during pregnancy, there are bleeds, sometimes spontaneous bleeds, sometimes due to trauma, and they occur, and the vast majority of those bleeds are less than one millimeter. But what happens is the HPA1 a positive platelets from the fetus enter the circulation, the maternal circulation. The mother sees these as immunologically foreign. She raises antibodies against these foreign platelets and therefore alloimmunizes. And in turn, these, platelet, these antibodies can go back across the placenta into the fetus, removing platelets from the baby. This can be devastating consequences. Intracranial hemorrhage, stillbirth, miscarriage, uh, because of the immunological mismatch. So, kind of counterintuitively, but exactly the same as the treatment of rhesus disease of the newborn, if you give a very, very small dose of the antibody that causes the issue, you can prevent, the theory is you'll prevent the mother aluminizing. This is exactly what happens in rhesus disease of the newborn. 
The fundamental immunology is called ANUS, antibody mediated immune suppression. And again, there's lots of texts on that, there's lots of theories how this works. We kind of have a simple view of the world, which is if you remove the offending platelets, i.e., from the fetus, the mother doesn't see them as an immunological mismatch and she doesn't aluminize. So it essentially prevents aluminization. Uh, numbers we spoke about, whereas rhesus negativity is around 15, 20% of the population, this is much smaller. And actually, we only have really good data in the Caucasian population. So all the numbers I'm going to speak about is Caucasian. And that's because the large natural history studies were done in Norway, Poland, the Netherlands, and the UK. So the numbers that we have are very strong from there. I'll speak a little later about um, <coughs> a natural history study we're doing. We like to know what the mutation rate in all populations. We know it exists in Africa, African American, Hispanics, Middle Eastern, Southern Asian. We know it doesn't exist in Eastern Asian. It's a different mutation there. Uh, the natural history study will give us really good numbers. So where does the 22,000 come from? Just think of a simple funnel. First of all, we'll take, uh, there's around 8 million live births in um, Europe, North America, we added Australia in there. If we take the Caucasian population for that, oh, please come in. Oh, good to see you, Dan. Hi. Um, if you take the Caucasian population of that number and look for HPA1A negative mice, and we know from the natural history study that's about 2%. So that's our first filter. HPA1A negative mums, about 2% of the 8 million. Some really excellent academic work shown that there's a particular human leukocyte antigen subtype. And if the mother was positive for this HLA subtype, it's called DRB3-0101, she had a 30-fold greater chance of aluminizing. The belief is that it's the presentation of the antigen. So that is an enrichment factor in the number. So we took that 30% that we're going to be HLA, DRB3, O101 positive, right? We're looking for two other things. The mother, by dint of previous births, may have already aluminized. So we took that into account. If she is, uh, has already aluminized, it's too late. This prevention will not work. And then, for the sake of the math, we also looked at fetus being HPA1A positive. And if you do a hardy Weinberg calculation, it's like over 90%. So if you use all of these filters from the 8 million, you come to a number of 22,000 at-risk moms every year in those geographies. Now, of the 22,000, we know that about a quarter to a third of those will go on to aloimmunize. And of that group of moms that aloimmunize, we know about a quarter to a third will go on to have a baby with FNAIT. What we don't know is which mom is going to aluminize or have that baby. So essentially, 22,000 is the treatable population in the Caucasian population. That number will definitely go up once we find out the numbers in those other ethnicities. By how many, we don't know. So when we did our analysis, and we did this uh, during diligence before we brought the assets in, we worked on these conservative numbers. Interestingly, and unlike all the other rare diseases that we worked in in our former life, there's great recognition of FNAIT. If you go to any clinic, and the first thing we did was just start going to clinics, Everybody has heard of FNAIT. The vast majority of people have seen babies with it. So the recognition is um, tremendous. And the target profile that Derek and Laura and our commercial group have been going out with has been very favorably received. At the moment, these physicians have no treatment for this devastating, potentially devastating condition. Um, so the commercial opportunity we think is great. For the sake of our models, we plug in a price. We haven't spoken about that price. Um, but we plug that in to see in any way you look at this, this has potential blockbuster uh, all over it. If you just look at how these babies are treated now, 
or if the mother has alloimmunized and she knows she's going to have another baby, you know, they're treated with IVIG at the moment. Uh, so we've got a pretty good handle on what that looks like. And as I say, only with the figures that we have today. The absolute key to making this successful is getting the HPA1A status into routine clinical testing when the mom first goes to the doctor, and that is you know, a very motivated population. Um, I always hate talking about pregnant moms going to the doctor, right? I've never been pregnant. We have had four children, though, and we have had four grandchildren, so I know a tiny bit about it. Um, so the idea would be the mom goes in the first trimester, she is tested for her HPA1A status. And at that time, if she's negative, then she would go through other tests to see if she's in that highly at-risk population. I'll speak about what's key to getting this screening uh, done in a, in a slide or two. Um, so 212 monoclonal antibody. Uh, one of the assets that we got from this company, Norwegian company, uh, we got polyclonal serum, which we call 211. I'll show some data, proof of concept data on that. We also got the sequence of a monoclonal antibody that was derived from the B cell of a mom that had aluminum and had, in fact, had babies with FNAIT. Uh, it would be a subcutaneous injection. It's a very, it looks a very well-behaved antibody, infrequently ministered. We say here no more than once a week, potentially for once every two weeks. That will be you know, proven or otherwise in terms of the studies that I'll show you. And then all the other benefits of having a monoclonal antibody. I'll show a couple of pieces of data very quickly. Um, working with Professor Newman at the University of Wisconsin, he created a mouse model of FNAIT. And if you think about it, they don't have human platelet antigen mice, but he engineered a mouse, which he calls an APLDQ mouse, which is essentially uh, uh, HPA1A positive. That's the mouse he created. We actually created that mouse with them to be able to do maternal fetal toxicology. That's why we created it. This was going to be the, the major regulatory filing in terms of maternal fetal tox. It has this wonderful other ability to be a great efficacy model. So again, I won't go into details and all the data, but the two panels here show that by taking the HPA positive platelets from this APLDQ mice and transfusing them, transfusing them into wild type mice, we don't have any HPA1A status but can recognize foreign platelets, and then looking to see what happens when uh, we, we use 2 on 2. The first panel shows exactly what I said at the beginning. What you're looking for is the rapid and complete removal of platelets from this mouse circulation. It's exactly what we saw. And then secondarily, but really importantly, do we prevent the females from alloimmunizing? And the second panel shows that with 212. They do not alloimmunize. As I mentioned, we had, um, how are we doing for time, Jenny? I think I'll just speed up. Okay, I'll speed up a bit. Um, as I mentioned, we got a uh, polyclonal serum 211, which we had, so we did a human proof of concept study using 211. And in this, we took male uh, volunteers, happened to be in uh, Germany, male volunteers who were HPA1A negative. So think of these male volunteers as the mom. And we did two studies with these male volunteers. The study that's shown here what we did is we infused platelets, HPA1A positive platelets, so think that's the bleed. So the male is the mom, the infusion of the platelets is the bleed. And then 60 minutes later, I came in with the polyclonal serum 211. And what you see on this uh, graph is the rapid removal. Please note that the x-axis is ordinal. It goes from minutes to days. The placebo, if we injected any of our cells with platelets, they'd last about seven days. As the two placebo subjects. The other six subjects, you see there's rapid and complete removal of those platelets. Now, if you think about it, it's a little contrived. 
um, this experiment. So we did another experiment with 211 and human volunteers. And this time, rather than giving the plate or extended treatment, we gave the treatment to one one, and then seven days later, transfusion of platelets. We haven't, we're not going to present those data, they're part of an academic publication as we speak, but it looks exactly the same. And if you think about it, that mimics what would happen in real life. You'd have two one two on board, and then if there is a bleed, the platelets would be removed. So we're very pleased with uh, these results which we've published. 212 now, we also have proof of concept. And whilst we didn't show um, a complete set of data that we had with 212, we saw exactly the same thing. And in this experiment, we went straight to 212, seven days later, the platelet transfusion. And again, we saw the rapid and complete removal of platelets with the antibody. Further studies are ongoing now, <coughs> where we are doing pharmacokinetic and safety studies. Uh, with those volunteers. We have multi-dose um, study, the second one, and all these will read, uh, read out in due course. In saying that, in June, we're presenting at the ISTH, which is in Montreal, uh, this year in June, we will present the data for 212 that we have. And uh, one of our academics collaborator, Dr. Giesen, will uh, present. Uh, natural history study I mentioned, and, and really for two major reasons. The first is to get uh, other ethnicities to find out what the percentage of HPA 1A negativity is in these populations. But secondly, if you think of it, and this is very routine for rare disease, we are working with investigators, we're working with sites. All of these are open now as we speak, as we run this natural history study. And the only difference between the natural history study and the pivotal 2-3 study that we aim to do is the intervention. So everything else is going to be prepared using natural history sites and investigators. So when we come to do the uh, study with 212, we'll have the investigators and the sites lined up. It's very common in rare disease to do it this way. Um, by the end of this year, we'll have all the PK data, the safety data, we'll have the maternal fetal toxicology data that's running now, we'll have the full toxicology package, and with this package, we'll go to regulators end of this year, beginning of next year, to lay out our plans for the phase two, three pivotal study. A um, lot of work going on to how do you get onto the guidelines? Well, hi. Hi, Sylvia. Come in. How are you? Good, thank you. Um, how do you get onto the guidelines such that mums can be tested at the first trimester? So Derek and Laura and our team are really working very hard to see how, how do you do this. I think we've got a really good idea. I mean, clearly they look at data. Right? That's going to be the first thing they look at. They look at cost benefits to the payers. And so again, we need to do a lot of work in that realm to get those. We're very confident that once on the guidelines, mums will be tested. Right? Once you get onto these guidelines, mums will be tested. That will allow us to move on in this. Um, so really excited about the programme. I mean, it's, it's, I don't think we've worked on one that's quite the same. If you think about it, it's prevention of something happening. There's a biological precedent with the rhesus disease. Um, the actual the development doability is much easier than any, and I'm not trivialising it, in any other rare disease that we've ever worked in because of the numbers that are coming up. And the natural history study is going to be a beautiful foundation to allow us to do this. Looking forward to taking questions uh, on that programme. Let's move on then to, it's like chalk and cheese. We move from an area that I don't think many of us have even heard about, when we brought these assets into one that we're super familiar with. And in fact, the background that many of us had in the company uh, over the last X years was in complement inhibition. So Dan, this will be like, I mean, you'll see things here that you think, my goodness, this is a deja vu. Also highly competitive, number of players out there as well, so that's totally different to FNAIT, and with that, you know that the molecule, the asset you come up with, is going to have to be differentiated or it won't make it in this area. We believe we have the potential for differentiation. 
and I'll show you why. Um, despite other parts of the complement pathway being attacked at the moment with different assets, we like complement factor 5 a lot in the terminal part of the cascade. We know if you block off C5, you can block the devastating consequences of complement dysregulation. We see there's still a significant unmet, unmet medical need, both in the way that you deliver these complement inhibitors, but also in the way that you go for indications, which indications that you go after in terms of complement dysregulation. And then commercial pathways and, uh, and development, the, the focus here, there are areas that we know a lot about. We have tremendous expertise uh, in the company to be able to develop these assets or a couple of assets <coughs> in particular. I won't go into the complement pathway. It'll be well known to most of you. The changes that have happened here in the last few days is there was a great uh, focus on complement factor five. Now many other parts of the pathway are being looked at. I have to say we also looked at other parts of the pathway uh, uh, during our time in our former company. Um, however, C5 is a very compelling target and why we're so interested in the asset we have. And then unlike with, if you think about complement inhibition, started with paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobin urea, that molecule was, uh, came out in 2007, followed in 2012 by atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome, and then more recently refractory myasthenia gravis and urimylitis spectrum disorder. Actually, tiny number of indications we know that there's over 50 diseases implicated with complement dysregulation, things that we believe that we can go after. The reason for the potential differentiation of rally by 116 is that it's an antibody. And if you think of this simply as being a very small antibody, it has the binding domain of an antibody without all the other parts, and it's linked to an albumin binding domain which extends the half-life and distributes it through the bloodstream. Um, these AFI bodies are really interesting. There's a phase three AFI body at the moment that's doing very well in dermatological diseases that happen to be a completely different mechanism. But it's kind of leading the path for the potential of AFI bodies as genuine medicines. Why would it be differentiated? At the moment, the uh, inhibitors are given by uh, intravenous, intravenous injection, in case of echolizumab every two weeks, in case of uh, ravelizumab every eight weeks. Um, there is some play in subcutaneous, but it's usually with a large device and is quite invasive to the patient. The ability of these antibodies, if it all plays out, is this will be low volume, subcutaneous injection, less frequent dosing. That's the differentiation. That will allow us to go into other indications that currently there's no approved treatments for. So the delivery piece and the new indications piece is really uh, the major points. There's a, there's a bunch of other potential benefits, but these are the uh, main benefits. I'll go to speed up now, Janie, okay? Yep, go for it. We're doing a very um, conventional single ascending dose study in Rally Bio uh, 116. And in fact, we presented some data in November last year from one of the cohorts before we finished the study, and I'll speak about that. But this will run out for the rest of uh, the year. We're also doing multiple ascending dose uh, studies with 116. Here's the data that we showed in November, and the two panels show Two different things. First of all, the first panel is just a pharmacokinetic profile of 116 at the 100 milligram dose. So when I talk about small volumes, this is 100 milligrams, and it's 100 milligrams in one milliliter. So it's a milliliter dose. Genuine small volume. Think auto injector pen. Think of Wigovi or other uh, in, in injectors that are used uh, today. So the pharmacokinetic panel shows a very well-behaved molecule. You look at the tightness of the bars, a half-life of greater than 300 hours. We were very pleased with this profile. The amazing thing about complement is that we know from echinoclizumab and ratolizumab, what you see in these early phase one studies plays through to phase two and patient studies and on the market. Once you know how complement factor five is 
reduce by using this. And the, the holy grail we look for is rapid, complete, and sustained inhibition of 3C5. And that's what we presented uh, last uh, November. If you look at the six uh, subjects, all with 100 milligrams, uh, very well behaved in the, uh, the placebo portfolio, uh, the profile, you look at greater than 99% reduction. So from the single ascending dose, we can tell that it's rapid and complete. The multiple ascending dose will give us the, is it sustained? And that data we will have by the end of this year. So we'll complete the sad, we'll complete the mad, and at the same time, we will discuss the strategy for new indications, what indications we're going after. Um, you know, we like paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobin urea. It's a kind of standard condition where you know the complement is dysregulated, so we like that. Um, but what other indications we'll go after? As a small company, we have to be very careful. We can't do 50 indications. So we'll be very thoughtful about where we work. Um, very quickly, as part of the suite of assets that we got from Sobe, we got a pegylated body, which one of our scientists thought that could really be very helpful in ophthalmology conditions. So we ran some experiments to show that it did have you know, potential. Since then, the great art here will be extending the half-life of the body. So we did a really nice deal um, with a company called iPoint and their Duracert technology, which will look to extend the half-life. It's actually not 114, it's the name, it's unpegylated. Oh, that sounds important, Dan. <laughs> um, and these, these uh, preclinical experiments are going on in the iPoint laboratories now. We provide the material, they provide the technology. So we're really looking forward to seeing what happens here. Quickly, three preclinical programs. I spoke about our metriptase 2 inhibitor uh, from Sanofi, uh, which is for anemic disorders, early stage preclinical. ENPP1 is the first target with the company Exciencia. This is a machine learning AI small molecule company. Uh, an ENPP inhibitor has potential for the treatment of hyperphosphatasia, an area that we know quite well. There is a uh, marketed approval there that leaves something to be desired on uh, delivery. This is a small molecule, it would be a small molecule treatment. And then last but not least, that Abcellera. We've not named any of our targets yet. It's a multi-year, multi-deal, a uh, multi-target deal that we have with Abcellera. We'll speak about these other three programs as data emerge over the next uh, period and when we get into the clinical. So last but not least, I've spoken about our clinical programs. We have the ISTH coming up uh, in Montreal. By the fourth quarter, we'll have the multiple ascending dose for 116. Really important data for us. Uh, we'll probably read out on some, you know, in terms of the natural history study in 212 also. And then, you know, we'll, we'll see where those data take for. The early stage programs will move on. Um, but we're really excited about the programs we're working in. We think there's tremendous potential to treat these devastating diseases and transform the lives of the patient. I'm going to stop there and look forward to questions and challenges, wild praise. I can take anything. This is Laura Ekas, always in a hurry. Did you know that, Derek? That's Laura there, yeah? always in a hurry in our offices. So please, I'm looking forward to um, questions, comments. And again, I've got such an array of wonderful colleagues with me. Um, they will be brought on to answer as well. That we prepared for there. Please. So for the FNAIT program, is the addressable population 22,000, or is it the subset? Great question. Um, it's the 22,000. Because we don't know which models go on to our webinars, or which the our webinars go on to have the devastating consequences, it will be the 22,000. And as I say, that number will go up as we find out about other ethnicities. Does that make sense? Yep. yep. So for, for payer discussions, it would be sort of preventative as well as, well, actually, somewhat preventative. 
absolutely. We've had a number of those. Derek and his team. I'm going to call on Derek just to speak to some of those discussions. <coughs> it's really important. There is an interesting piece of this to me, though, is moms who are not HLA DRB 30101 positive, so they're negative, they are still at risk. They're just not as at risk. So, as Steve Uden says, somebody brighter than him will have to decide right, how, how those mums that are, are just simply HPA1 negative, how they will be treated. But Derek, what's your thoughts? And just to just add that, the, the, the payers are pretty well aware of the population as well, and they're, they're well aware of the devastating outcomes of FNA. <laughs> so, um, and they're, they're also very well aware, and speaking to physicians, that um, they're sort of woefully unprepared to deal with this condition by, by treating only those moms who have already allimmunized and trying to prevent FNA occurring again in a subsequent pregnancy. And that they're also well aware of the cost associated with that. The cost of IVIG, is, as Martin had on one of the slides, is um, in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. So um, I think the, there is definitely room for a preventative approach. Great questions, of Scott, really. I mean, it's, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about this population. As I say, there's these moms that are just simply negative I don't know how we we're going to, we're going to do that, actually, but they're still at risk of having the devastating consequences. We'll have to work that through. Dan, please. With the subcutaneous route, uh, could a patient self-administer if it's every week, every two weeks, or does that have to be monitored post, uh, uh, post administration? Yeah, so they believe with both 116, actually, and 212 that it could be self-administered. And I mean, Folks are so, um, you know, with the GLP ones now and that world of having these auto injectors that are getting simpler and simpler all the time, that would be the belief. The one slight caveat to that we talk about during pregnancies, the moms see the, the docs quite regularly. So there's Yeah, but it, I mean, I, I think you said weekly, you're, you're thinking? We're actually hoping two weekly, which would make a big difference. But again, Derek, what do you think? I mean, this. Yeah, I th we're, we're thinking about it in both ways. So it, it could be, if it would be more convenient, it could certainly be administered by the patient herself. Um, we're not expecting, you know, monitoring in the hour <coughs> days afterwards. Um, and if it would be preferable, it could be administered by uh, an, a, a nurse who could come to the patient's home or in the doctor's office. With 116, you, you think of the world that we lived in with, you know, patients having to go every two weeks for an intravenous oh, yeah. injection and essentially taking a day out of their lives every two weeks. Fantastic treatment, though. Eculizumab's a wonderful medicine. Ravalizumab helped with it being every eight weeks. But think about the notion of genuine small volume, subcutaneous. It's, it's a different world. And okay. Dan, you will remember, we did a lot of analysis in our company where we looked at what was preferable to patients and subcutaneous, infrequently dosed, small volume was right up there in terms of attractiveness. Please, Sarah. How geographically uh, dispersed is your development plan and your plans for moving forward with the regulators? Yes. For 212? Or the FNAIT? Well, either one is fine. For 212, um, all the volunteer studies we've conducted in Germany it's kind of a lot of the basic work was done in Europe on this. So we had this, the Fraunhofer Institute in Germany, it's a wonderful institute, it's on the site of the German Red Cross. So we've been able to do these studies there. However, after that, it's then going to be global. The natural history studies in the US and, and Europe also, it's both. Once we find out, get a better handle on the frequency and these other ethnicities, you think about the phase two, three trial, that might be opened up more. I have to say, though, from the natural history study so far, the motivation in Europe and the US is very high. The knowledge about the disease is, is much higher than any rare disease we've got. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I was thinking about the Asian population and thinking how you could tap into that if that actually had um, prevalence. As I say, we know it exists in Southern Asians, Eastern Asians, Dozens sort of different mutations, so not China, Japan. But to your point, I mean, in our romantic way, we want to be able to eradicate this from everywhere. How do you treat everybody with this condition? No matter where we actually live, that's our aim. 
When do you start treating the mom? So you're doing the yep. screening at 10 to 14 weeks. Yep. Such a good question. And again, we use science to inform that very question. So the mom comes in at the first trimester and quickly, and, and again, there's a lot of work being done on the diagnostic. The diagnostics exist now because of platelet transfusions. They are used for this. And so part of the work stream is to make sure these diagnostics are very inexpensive. But the mom would have her HPA1A status. If you think about it, 98% of the time it's going to be um, positive and not have anything else. If she's negative, we'll do the DRBT very quickly after it. That time, that's when we start treatment. Oh, okay. Around then, we know uh, from nice academic studies that the first sign of aluminization yeah. is, is around um, 17. Oh, okay. Weeks, so it has to be from there. And that's why being able to administer infrequently is going to be really important. Right? And if it's every two weeks, it is a number of injections. Rogam and Winnipeg are given just now at week 26 and on delivery. Different antigenic profile that the rhesus antigens have, that you're able to do that. Who knows in time how this will play out, but at the moment it would be every two weeks as soon as she is at risk. Okay. And the other piece of this I always think, JD, is it's so unusual because the mom is healthy and the baby's healthy. It's just this immunological mismatch that causes the issue, and we have to bear that in mind. Please, sit there. Yes, so the screening test is already available, but is it inexpensive now? And what is your role going to be in expanding that test and making it much more, well, into guidelines and much yeah. more accessible? Such a good question. I'm going to let um, Derek come in in a moment also to talk about it. It's not as inexpensive as it could be because it's used in this platelet transfusion world. So nobody's had the uh, motivation to get the cost down. Our role in it will be to work with diagnostic companies to do this. And the company that we work with just now for the clinical studies is excellent. Right? But the <coughs> clinical studies will almost certainly work with other partners to make sure this isn't expensive. It's going to be key, actually, to it. But Derek, please. Yeah, sure. Um, just to, to add to that, uh, the, the test exists already in uh, transfusions and transplants. So as part of our development program, we will validate those tests in the context of FNAIT. Uh, which that's that's the, the novel piece. That is not what has been done. The tests are currently reimbursed. Um, they're in the low hundreds of dollars range. Um, but if you think about um, uh, the coronavirus and the, the PCR tests for that, you think about what they cost in the beginning versus now. So it, it, it'll be a similar um, situation of scale and we believe once the the tests are given at scale to all moms eight million a year that those tests will will come right down to be in line with the the other pregnancy panels so the test is something you can in essence like generically get involved with or not get involved with with another diagnostic company it, exactly and that, that's exactly There's what no, we're exploring right now we're not looking to create a patent around the testing we're looking to make it as widely no, available right. and cheap as possible <laughs> Great question. And we will do the tests, right? In, as, as this hopefully progresses with this potential, a diagnostic company will take this on and be part of this routine panel, I should say. I think it would be easy to be accepted once you have proof of concept in patients that the drug works. That's what we tell Derek and Laura that should be easy <laughs> about making up. Once you get there, yes. Yeah. Would it be a companion diagnostic? Well, essentially, it has to be yeah. considered that way. The mom is going to be tested for a number of things. Our, our, our middle doctor just had a baby, and at every hospital visit, doctor's visit, I was asking her what was happening, how much blood was taken. And she thought I was a caring father. <laughs> she just wanted to know this program. So, yeah, it would be it would just part of the routine testing, of which lots of tests. And these tests, they're getting more and more. I mean, now moms can have be, be genetically tested for over 300 diseases if they pay out of pocket. So it'll be part of that suite. Any other questions? Back to you, JD. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the questions. Thank <laughs> you.
No, I would love to take a picture for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, Rich. Yeah. Mark, I want to say hi in person. Hi, Rich. 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 Hi,
Good. Good. I'm in charge of this AV system, which I think is quite complex. <laughs> and I don't know where the next talk is. Are there these rooms, I wonder, like, when they built this, it was probably like state of the art. I wonder if it's still like state of the art. It's pretty good, but they have like a, they have a full yes, uh, it's it's a small for this building. Oh, really? yeah. But I think with filming at once, it's probably like.